I just want to make a clarification of something that was said, and I think it's time to really set the record straight. I want the media to report what I say, how I said it, and how it actually was done. I hope, Andrew Dick, your camera is working because you just like to catch me with awkward positions. And I want, I want to show it to everyone so it can be in the papers, it can be out in the mail that what was said in a personal, private, coalition group chat. It was never directed to one individual. It was never directed to a specific person. I was addressing all the ministers. I was addressing all the members of parliament in the coalition, not one individual. So to make it sound and to insinuate that I was attacking you or I came at you and you can be, have your own opinion and you're being muzzled, absolutely not true. The chat was created for us to vent, for us to discuss. Ask questions, that's where we put it. That's where we put it. And the first time I sent the same thing was on October 13th. It's right here. October 13th. October 13th was the first time it was said. Last week, Thursday, I said, please state your position. A yes or no to all the members of parliament in the coalition and to all the ministers because I felt games were being played. And I said, it's time to stop playing games. Let the people them know, are you in favor, yes or no? That was my position. I never, never did I call anybody name. Never did I direct it to anyone. Absolutely not true. Not true. So I hope that leads to rest. And I hope it's being recorded. And I hope it's what I said. Nobody attacked anyone. Nobody went personally against anyone. It was in our group chat. Second to it, another issue. And here is where I question sometimes the newspapers. Not one question from the media came. Not one question from the media came. And then what do I see in the papers this week earlier? That I am taking donation money. I am taking donation money that was sent to us and spending it on the project. And nobody called to find out if it's true. Nobody asked a question, but it's in the papers that I am taking 150,000 guilders, money that was donated to us for the project. Absolutely not true. Lies, lies, and more lies. That's what it is. And it is shameful. It is shameful because the leader of the UP party know how the process works. No way, no how can I walk in by the Minister of Finance and say, give me 150,000 guilders. Could never work. Each and every minister know their limit of signing is under 50,000 guilders. So how and where that I can just take 150,000 guilders and spend it? How? Stop lying to the people. Absolutely not true. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to welcome to the lectern Minister of Finance, the Honorable Richard Gibson. You know, I've been the 
the uh, year, many years ago, I was the founder of the JCs on St. Martin. And the JC's Creed has a sentence in it. Uh, and that creed, before every meeting of the JC's Club, uh, we have to stand and recite that creed. And the sentence that burned into my mind is, government should be of laws rather than of men. That sentence sent a clear message to me at the time that in every society, uh, uh, you have to have rules, regulations, processes that you follow. And those processes should not be diverted by one or two other people outside of what the laws state. Government should be of laws rather than of men. I say that because there are laws and there are regulations governing expenditures by government. And I've made it during my tenure uh, a passion to bring fiscal discipline to the government. The law also states that in times of a disaster, a natural disaster, uh, what steps you're allowed to take and what steps you're not allowed to take as far as finance is concerned. Given the Hurricane Irma disaster and disasters all over the world, not only here, in the Pacific, in Mexico, in Haiti. Um, there are always three phases after a disaster. A phase that has to do with immediate relief. Immediate relief, you define, listen, you gotta get electricity back up, you gotta get water back running, you gotta get some kind of shelter uh, for people, uh, those are all steps that qualify for immediate relief. The law states that in such a case, and as far as immediate relief is concerned, you can get a dispensation from your budget to spend money if um, there are no provisions in your budget for those expenditures. In fact, it says you have to do that uh, in a consultation with the uh, Prime Minister of the Council of Ministers of the Kingdom. But if, because of the disaster, you can't get hold of him, you can go ahead and spend that money. Uh, and as soon as you can get hold of him, you've got to um, request his consent to go along with the expenditures you make outside of the budget that was a result of that disaster. The next phase is the phase of recovery. It has nothing to do with immediate relief because that is then past. You get back your water, you get back your electricity, you have tarpaulins in your house, now it comes to recovery. When it comes to recovery, now you have a serious problem because you have to deal with it from within your budget. But you have not budgeted monies, because you didn't have, for all uh, what it will take for recovery costs. And therefore, you need to go in discussions and see how you can get recovery financing. And then the third step is the rebuilding. Well, to get to that recovery step, what we had to do is take everybody and prepare a new budget. A new budget to deal with the reality because the budget which you had for 2017 
is a budget that is no longer based on reality. Preparing a budget, you don't do that overnight. But we've been working on that budget, and last week uh, we finally succeeded in getting a budget presented to the Council of Ministers and getting it approved. And in that budget, uh, uh, provisions has been made for the additional costs that we're going to have uh, uh, and the funding that's going to be needed for it, uh, where, for instance, when it comes to understand for people, the amount that we had was doubled because there'll be more people seeking understand. Now, of course, that budget passed by COM doesn't uh, legitimize uh, the execution of that budget. It's still got to go to the Council of Advice, which it has gone, and then the Parliament and get Parliament to confirm the budget. And then um, you can start with making the expenditures. Uh, in the process, because there's so much money needed after the disaster Irma that struck us, that you need to have consultations with other countries um, looking for aid, looking for um, donations, looking for loans to meet the numbers that you have in your budget and to get it covered because you can't spend money out of air. You have to have a source to be able to pay the money that's there. Now, in our case, I think that when you look back and you see how fast St. Martin rebounded from the most vicious storm we've had in history. How fast we came back. In fact, it was so fast that even the Prime Minister or the Minister of Kingdom Affairs of the Netherlands in a letter wrote, complimenting St. Martin with its bounce back ability, which they recognize uh, how fast the people of St. Martin, putting their shoulders under all the work that has to be done, brought St. Martin back to a situation that was amazing. Amazing in that if we look next door at Puerto Rico, up to this minute as I speak, 70% of the people of Puerto Rico still do not have electricity. 50% have running water. But I don't only have to look at Puerto Rico. I invite you to look at St. Thomas, the French side of St. Martin, Dominica. Compare where we are today compared to where they are. And we got the brunt of the storm. So in terms of work, steps, taking to deal with this vicious storm, the worst in the history of St. Martin, St. Martin has done an excellent job. Now that has been muddied, the water has been muddied somewhat uh, because you always have these situations. I never thought, for instance, that President Trump would be elected as the President of the United States but he shocked and surprised everybody that he was. He did get elected. And the question is, how come? Why? And when I listen to news and I hear that through Facebook and twin Twitter, 126 million citizens of the United States were influenced by Russian organizations who through Facebook who through Twitters, who through messaging on social media, reached these 126 million people. Then I can understand how Mr. Trump got elected. Facebook, social media is a powerful medium. Influence 
the thought pattern of people. But if you take reality, when I talk as far as Irma is concerned, and we look and compare what we've done, uh, where we are, where others are, there cannot be any doubt that we have done a fantastic job. Notwithstanding who says what on social media, notwithstanding fake news, notwithstanding stories, and their stories that are told, and if you don't get behind each and every one of the story, they live their own life, and then you elect a Trump. I am satisfied that we have done, uh, each one of us, uh, the job that we needed to do. Uh, one other clarification I'd like to give, because people also misunderstand and misinterpret that. When we had the Island Council of St. Martin, the Island Council as a council acted as a collective body. They made collective decisions. In country St. Martin, since 10, 10, 10, that changed. We no longer have collectivity in government. We have ministerial responsibility. And each minister is responsible for his own ministry. In other words, I can't walk over to the minister of Romy and tell the minister of Romy, I want that roof fixed. That minister have the responsibility with his organization to bring proposals to the Council of Ministers as to how he would like to tackle certain things, whether it's clean up, whether it is um, repairing roads. That's his area of responsibility and authority. I can't interfere with that. He cannot interfere with mine. So we have also, as far as Social matters are concerned. There's one ministry responsible for that. And I cannot tell that ministry what they should do as far as social services are concerned. I can say, as come, if a proposal comes to come that we approve a million and a half guilders for uh, food and come approves that, then is that minister and that ministry who has to execute that program. And how that is executed, uh, it's his responsibility. I can't interfere with it. The same thing holds good with distribution of tarpaulins or uh, providing uh, emergency uh, homes as a social matter. That concerns that ministry not finance, not Vrumi, or not any of the other ministries. This silo, because that's what it is, silo separation in government is one that was purposely and intentionally organized in that manner. And the minister leading that particular uh, ministry is liable and responsible under the law for whatever goes on in that ministry. And other ministers cannot interfere. In the background of all of this um, plays the conditions that the Netherlands posed that really had nothing to do with aid and had nothing to do with Irma. It was an opportunity that uh, they thought uh, should be used to get certain things done that they would like to see get done. And they set a deadline that this government had to make it known 
that they would accept those conditions before October 31st. This government had until October 31st, based on the last communications that was sent to us in writing, to express their preparedness to accept those conditions. That deadline was met. When somebody sends conditions, you don't immediately embrace and accept all of their conditions. In fact, I want to remind everyone that it was our own parliament back in January who passed a unanimous resolution prohibiting this government from accepting the integrity chamber as the Netherlands has proposed it. This prime minister and each minister in this government is bound by that resolution passed by parliament. And what we did, we tried to negotiate. We tried because there is a beautiful, a beautiful saying in Dutch. Geen glans zonder wrijving. You're shooing on shine unless there's friction. It needs friction to shine. And that is the friction that we were applying in the hope to shine and in hope of achieving something which we took an oath for before October 31st deadline. And we've complied. Anybody who says anything different is simply not speaking the truth. Finally, there's a lot of buzz going around that um, there might be a motion passed in Parliament, a motion of no confidence in this government. I'm proud of being part of this government. Um, I would refer you to the accomplishments of this government. Uh, I would especially remind you of the moments when you stood with pride in terms of the ability of not me, but this government in getting budgets balanced to the surprise of everyone. Um, looking back, I think we've, we've, been, we've performed ex exemptionally. If a motion of no confidence is passed against this government, I want to announce now that I immediately following that submit my resignation as Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. In remarks, I'd now like to welcome to the lectern Minister of Justice, the Honorable Raphael Bosman. Members of the media, colleagues, televiewers, radio listeners, I believe that this is the first time since the passing of the hurricane that I'm standing at this lectern for a press briefing. I know um, a week or two ago I had a press, brief, a press briefing with the Honorable Prime Minister pertaining to the conditions that were um, posed by the Dutch government for recovery. I made some notes, but I'm going to change the order to follow in sync with uh, my colleague, the Honorable Minister of Finance. And I would like to start by reminding you and the people of St. Martin that a lot of the discussions that are taking place today and uh, some of the problems that supposedly exist within the government is all being motivated by the fact that we had a hurricane or two hurricanes. Because I, tend, I, 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 I 
tend to believe that sometimes we forgot that. We forgot that this country was devastated by the most vicious hurricane that crossed the Caribbean. And as I drove into work this morning, um, I, I, I looked around. And if you are a visitor that did not read the newspaper, did not follow the news, and you come to St. Martin, you would wonder, you would see some houses damaged, etc. but you would you would tend to be, but I hear people talking about this serious devastation. The roads, even the districts, the heap of garbage, old zinc, etc. that a few weeks ago when I drove around on this island, I thought I was someplace in a war zone in Syria or Iraq, the way this place looked. And today, when I see how far we have come, amazing. Kids are in school. The schools are open, albeit that some schools still need repairing. There are, there are emergency buildings this government, and particularly the Minister of Education, sought to it. And that we suffered, that our kids' education can continue. Institutions are operational again. In the whole discussion that we had about the Integrity Chamber and the Prime Minister explained the process of, 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 of legislation and that it has to go to the Council of Advice. The, the, the building of the Council of Advice was destroyed. Destroyed. Yet, we managed to get an advice from the Council of Advice on legislation. Institutions are functioning. Government services are back up and running. The hospital is functioning. It's taking care of our ill. Utilities, water, light, albeit not all over, I would dare say 90% of the island have utilities back up and running. Food supplies are there. People, the, 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 the trade, people can go to a supermarket and buy food. They can buy water. I even believe you can buy furniture if you still want to. So not just the bare necessities you can get. You know, you, you, we, we, we are a functioning community. Telecommunications is available. And then we come to my area, law and order. It's functioning. There's law and order. You break the law, we're going to deal with you. The prosecution is functioning. Basically never stopped. The court system is functioning. For as far as the law and order part is concerned, first, and foremost, we have to thank our law enforcement officers. Our, and I underline and stress, our local law enforcement officers. A tremendous respect from me and this government towards our local law enforcement officers. Why? Because they were here. They experienced the storm. Their houses were ripped apart just like ours. But we did not have that additional responsibility to go out there and protect everybody else. They had. They signed up for that task and they lived up 
to that task. And that is the police, that is the customs, that is um, the, the VECA S, you name them. They, they were there. And then we realize, as in a situation like this, which is logical, that we could not do it alone. We could not do it alone. And we had help. The military assisted us. The police force of Curaçao assisted us. The police force of Aruba assisted us. The police force of the Bess Island assisted us. The police, the national police of the Netherlands is assisting us. The voluntary corps of Curaçao is assisting us. The service um, judicial affairs in the Netherlands assisting us, and they are all still here. As a matter of fact, about five minutes before coming to this press briefing, I swore in three officers who also now just came to the island to assist us. So law and order, and that includes immigration, that includes border control, that includes all aspects of law and order is functioning on St. Martin with the assistance of all of our colleagues um, in the kingdom, for which we are very, very grateful. The hurricane, like we all mentioned, devastated us. You know, <laughs> this, this particular ministry, um, it is not everything we can run to the media and tell the media about what we are doing because we will be defeating um, the purpose of security, okay? So sometimes um, we just can't do that. Our prison, for instance, was basically left in shambles. Walls were actually down. The outside walls, etc., were in shambles. You know, you don't want to go out there and um, uh, announce the, these things because you might have people not as honorable as you and, and, and us and may have, oh, okay, since that is the case, maybe we can do this or that. So your, 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 your first objective at a certain moment is the safety of the inmates because we put them there Right? Yes, because of what they did, but we put them there. They are re our responsibility. We have to make sure that they are safe. The workers who go out every day to do their work in that uh, location, we have to make sure that they are safe. And naturally, the community at large, we have to make sure that they are safe. And some actions have been taken for, besides uh, uh, some repair works that have taken place up there. But there too, also, we have had assistance from outside, from in, from in the Netherlands, from the Deans Justiciele Instellingen, um, Judicial Services uh, Department, if I may translate very roughly. And one of the things we saw in a newspaper today where the, uh, the Solicitor General um, announced a transfer of inmates to Curaçao and to the Netherlands, and this also has to do with safety reasons for their own safety because of the condition of the, of the, the location and also to be able to um, uh, make the necessary uh, repairs to that location. We have also uh, fixed up the detention center in Simpson Bay and it would be taken into use shortly. The police the substation in Simpson Bay has been opened. I believe on the 30th, um, there was a big celebration, Halloween celebration, something like that, at, at, at Kimsha Beach. And realizing the necessity of having also adequate police controls and protection in that area, um, although not totally um, repaired, but a lot of work was done to have that substation up and running, and it was open and will be manned um, 
to take care of the security in that area. We, as I mentioned, we have many officers from uh, the other parts of the kingdom on St. Martin. We have requested for those, that assistance to continue at least until January to make sure that we can cover our season, our opening of um, when we get back, um, especially cruise tourism and um, the Christmas holidays. And hopefully in the recovery, um, we would be able to have that continue. A lot have been done. People are moving around. People are feeling safe. We are seeing patrols all over the place. This has also been the work of this government. Then I must say a few words on the condition that was put on border control. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't like to get into the political rhetorics of the stuff, but the fact is that governing is political. And I have been asked to do this job by uh, a political party, the USP party, under the leadership of MP Franz Richardson. And I know some people are gonna say that I'm saying that just because he's standing in the audience. And the Honorable Prime Minister who leads his government. And like my colleague before me said, um, Minister Gibson said, it has been an honor for me to be able to have done this job. And I, 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 I would say, yammer, yammer, yammer. The border control. Tell the Netherlands or any other government that we do not want to assist and cooperate in border controls. And I think that members of the media also have a responsibility. That responsibility should not only be used to point out when we on this side slip up, do something wrong, say something wrong, but the biggest responsibility that the media has is to inform the people and to inform them properly. And I know they, 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 they are some of you sitting here today that I know have been doing that and have been doing that in a very professional manner. And I, I, I congratulate you for that. But border control has been a joint effort on St. Martin for many years before 10, 10, 10. If border control is in a devastating situation on St. Martin, it is because those who are involved in executing the border control messed it up. I do not share that opinion. I do not share the opinion that border control is in a devastating situation in St. Martin. Do I acknowledge that especially maybe now in this situation we need to beef up border control? Yes, I do. And the Prime Minister have said that. We have, we have all said that. Unfortunately, when these discussions take place, the people on the ground who are doing their work, and border control presently falls under our local chief of police, Mr. Carl John, and the commandant of the Mara who is presently on the island, Mr. Chris Hazer. These people have been an example as to how you can work together how the Netherlands and St. Martin can work together in the interest of the people of St. Martin. They have been doing a fantastic job by working together, not trying to take over each other's responsibilities, but by working together for the goal that was set out. And I want to make it clear to these good gentlemen and their officers that 
this government, myself and this government, in no form or fashion, if issues of border control are discussed, is referring to the work that they are doing. We applaud the work that they're doing, and we hope that we can continue doing that work together. So what is the big deal? The big deal is that all of a sudden, no forewarning, no discussion, no anything. Uh, we have ministers of justice have meetings twice a year where we sit and we discuss all aspects of the justice chain. We recently had one on St. Martin. In July, border control was on the agenda. The Mara Chaussee involvement was on the agenda, point seven and eight on the agenda. And at no time was it mentioned that something is wrong or we need to change something. While the agreements are, and there is a, a signed protocol, a signed protocol, an agreement that states exactly that. And it states that if we want to amend or have any discussions pertaining to those type of topics, we do that at that conference of the ministers of justice. The next conference of the ministers of justice is in January on Curacao. So naturally, one would be very surprised when a condition is put for border control uh, as a condition to give relief to St. Martin. When agreements are signed, when protocols are signed, shouldn't we all have the equal responsibility to live up to those protocols? I, I have been hearing from day one about a protocol that was signed in 2015 pertaining to the integrity chamber. And I've been hearing over and over and over, you signed that protocol, you agreed to that, and now we are going to, by the hook or the crook, we're going to force you to live up to that protocol. So what happened to another protocol that was signed in the same year where agreements were made? Parties don't have to live up to that one. What is the difference in protocols? That's where I refer to the responsibility of the members of the media. And in case you don't have the protocols that I'm talking about, we'd be glad to give you copies of them. But these are two protocols. And one, we are forced to live up to it, with all consequences of not living up to it. But the other one, the other party that signed the protocols, one of the other party that signed the protocol with us, have no obligation to live up to it. And we just accept it because we don't like this government. No, we have to inform the people correctly. The request was, or the demand was, to enter an underlinger regeling based on Article 38, Paragraph 1 of the Statute. Let it be known that the Ministry of Justice have entered into different underlinger regeling with the partners in the kingdom. There is absolutely no objection. That is why that article is there. It is not higher supervision supervision or anything, it says that parties can enter mutual agreements with each other. The, the last one that we entered was again July this year when we were talking about the exchange of DNA profiles. So there's nothing wrong with entering an, an underling an agreement. But if I was to, if you, if you were to rent a house from me or we're going to enter an agreement, a labor agreement, or what have you not. And I tell you that I want you to agree to an agreement that states that we are going to, that, that you're going to work for me. I want you to agree now to that. And we're going to discuss the details later. Would you agree? Would your attorney advise you to agree? You would say, I want, no, I think we should discuss the details. No, then I know what I'm agreeing to. 
And that is the situation. And the details this minister and this government received on Friday afternoon after five. The draft on the linger regeling that we are talking about that we were supposed to agree to before the 31st was received on Friday afternoon after five. It was immediately perused and discussed, and on Sunday, meetings were held with the two department heads involved, Mr. Carl John and Mr. Anthony Doran of the Douane, and discussions have been held um, up to yesterday and that, and I don't foresee any problems. And that is how you do an underlinger regeling. That's the whole concept of an underlinger regeling. You sit down, you discuss the conditions, and you reach an agreement. And that is what was done. But before Friday, we were asked to agree to something that we did not know the details of. And we did not say no. We asked to see the details. We asked to be able to discuss it because we didn't know what we would have been agreed. At least I did not know the details of what we were being going to agree to. So I, I, I don't want to um, elaborate much more on the conditions. I, I, um, I believe there's, there's still work to do whether it is one day, one week, or one month that we have remaining in office, I choose to dedicate that time to the job that I was asked to do, which is um, Ministry, Minister of Justice, and um, as Deputy Prime Minister, I support um, the Prime Minister and take that responsibility simple. And before ending, I would like to say something. Um, the Prime Minister, um, took <laughs> a lot of heat. And I guess Minister Gibson used one, one, um, gezegde, one phrase, there's another one, hoge bome vangen veel wind. And then when you're the tallest tree, although you're not the tallest person, I guess that comes with a job. However, a lot, a lot of it was unfair. But the Prime Minister is an honorable man. And I, I can talk from my point of view. At one time, there was an issue of the borders and containers and waiting for whether or not in Parliament. And um, the Prime Minister, it was, it was <laughs> anyway, he took a lot of heat for that. As minister responsible for justice, I reached out to the prime minister and I said, look, if you want, I will go to parliament and I would answer those questions because I'm the minister of justice. I am responsible, okay? Whether I put them on the border or not, if, it, if, it, if it, uh, I gave the orders to do so or not, it was done. I know why it was done, and I take full responsibility for the fact that it was done, because it was done in the best interest of the people of St. Martin. It was done to protect the people of St. Martin for law enforcement. It may have clashed with political opinions, but we were in a state of emergency, et cetera. So I, I said to the Prime Minister, let me go to Parliament, and, and, and Prime Minister referred to the agreement that we had, we were in a state of emergency. The Prime Minister takes the lead into that. Um, we had also agreed that the Prime Minister would be the spokesperson for the government. That's why the other ministers were silent. Not, we were not silenced because we were not backing the Prime Minister or anything like that. And, and that is why I mentioned that the Prime Minister is an honorable man because he could have gone to Parliament and said, I'm my responsibility as a Minister of Justice. Go talk to him. And even when I offered to go, he stood there like a man and he took the blows. Prime Minister, you're an honorable man. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodney. Good day to all following this broadcast, especially to from within the ministry updates, etc. And I will still touch on some of it because it is quite important. We can send this out in writing. But I would like to reiterate and update, especially on the status of our schools, as I've been updated after the last school board meeting on last Friday. As Minister of Finance mentioned, as Minister of Justice has mentioned, the first response, I believe, is the most important, and showing unity and strength and this government did that. When I discussed an opening date for school, I got the support of this Council of Ministers. Not only that, we had international agencies on the island, UNICEF, USARNL, the Red Cross, and all as international agencies highlighted that education must continue and is a, a, a route to help the community to grow back and build back. And so I have no regrets with that October 2nd um, date that I had set and gotten the support for. And I thank all who made it possible, especially the hardworking teachers, the parents, the school boards, all of the ministries that were necessary to get the schools back open, all of the volunteers that assisted, and of course, the much needed emergency assistance from the Netherlands. So when people say we refuse aid, please think. We've been re accepting aid from before the hurricane. And the aid continues to come in. The aid we are still seeing is still emergency aid <clears throat> as the details of the recovery aid is being worked out. That's a discussion. That's a discussion. Also as a government, the Minister of Finance mentioned a number that was thrown out that the Council of Ministers agreed would go towards relief, 1.5 million for food. The details of that is being worked out. I believe as a government, we have been negligent in informing the public of this. It didn't happen this week, it didn't happen last week. It's something that's being worked out. But I believe that um, they might feel we might feel that if the public knows something is coming and doesn't come right away, there would be impatience and outcry. But I believe that people who know that something is coming will have hope. So I will say what else was decided. The Minister of Romy didn't say it, but there's also a plan for assistance of the rebuilding of homes for those who cannot help themselves. So besides being able to provide emergency housing, there's also a budget approved, which of course has to go through parliament, but it has passed our level and moved on to the Rat for Advis. In the amount of, I believe, three million, they can come, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. In education, this government approved 2.1 million guilders to assist in the emergency repairs for schools, and with school materials. Now, luckily, we received quite some school materials in both deliveries so far from the Netherlands. As a matter of fact, on October 13th, we received the first um, tranche where we can see if we drive by the pavilion on the pond fill, and if any have noticed movements around the uh, auditorium, the balance, the stuff that has to go inside those pavilions, tables and chairs, desks, etc., are being stored there until they are finalized. 
And there is a slight holdup, as I explained in the last press briefing, due to the problem with the connectivity for the electricity for the air conditioners that were sent. Those will have to return to the Netherlands because they're incompatible with the cycles that we have. And so there is a delay, and the Netherlands is working with us to be able to get the air conditions that will function. And so that has been the delay in them actually being used. Hopefully that will be resolved this week, as the schools are quite impatient to get their emergency situations better regulated. Yet I thank them for their patience. In our weekly reports, we are updated on the number of teachers, students returned, what is still an issue. We still have some fences down. We still have some classrooms that leak despite the emergency repairs. And now that, I mean, I hope that we can get an approval for the amended budget, and that becomes a priority for Parliament when it gets there, so that we can continue to give that aid from our budget that we need to give. Because in an emergency situation, you can deviate from your budget, but you can't deviate forever. So we need approval for the payments that we have to make to keep the country running and to give the assistance where it is needed before recovery aid gets here. As a matter of fact, 15% of our students are back, or sorry, only 15% of our students are not back in the classroom and 11% of teachers. In the meantime, school management and others within the school organization, teachers assistants and the like, are assisting to make sure that education is carried out and the inspectorate continues to monitor the situation. In terms of feeding, we also took a stand and in doing so, in discussions with UNICEF and the Red Cross, they came on board and said, we would like to assist you because that concern of, yes, you're gonna have the children in school, so GEBE made sure we had light and water. They're in a comfortable-ish situation, not 100%, but 80 to 90, comfortable. And food is an issue. Food was an issue. While the supermarkets had reopened, some parents may not be able to afford food. They haven't gone back to work yet. So we decided we would feed the children and the teachers, as a matter of fact, in the public schools for which government is directly responsible. The Red Cross pledged they would feed 4,800 children. These covered the elementary registrations. We have some discussions where that is concerned, but we welcome the 4,800 breakfasts and lunches when they are finalized. This week, they were able to start with the breakfast programs. Up until this week, government has been spending from its coffers to be able to feed the children of the public schools about 1,000 meals. And I was asked about that and responded in well, send the responses to the Prime Minister to give for me in Parliament. Care for our children was regulated, and for teachers, as well as families, if they requested it via the schools, and is still available. Initial assessments were done. Students, teachers, etc., are still being assisted, as well from the school care teams, as well as from private psychologists. We have come far. Last weekend during the rains, I was holding my head because I know there are still people without rules who refuse to leave their homes. They may be living in one room of their house. And I know with the small leaks that I have in mind what I'm going through, so I imagine the big leaks that they have. But after the rain came the sunshine. And while driving over the hills on Sunday, or actually standing at the special celebration we were having for sports in the complex and the fun day, I looked up and saw green hills again. Renewal and rebirth for the country. That gave me hope. The three children who came in with their student care coordinator to thank me for the meals we had provided for those first four weeks gave me hope. 
because where gratitude is there with a child's face and a child can hug you and say, thank you, the food was delicious. Then we are doing the right thing. We are taking care of our people. So I'd like to encourage the people who are still not in the best situation, even though the lines may be long, come to the government building and register for the assistance and the aid via VSR, via VROMI. I have asked the schools to also monitor, and in that assessment, we can also highlight which families are in need. And I know that the aid continues to be given through the Ministry of VSR to different organizations, the homes that the children are in, after school programs, elderly, vulnerable groups. So do not feel that there is no aid left from the initial. There is still aid. And don't let anybody, whether in social media or other places, fool you. Sports and culture hasn't gotten as much attention. Because for us, it was much more important to get our youth involved in their main activities, education. However, our sports facilities did sustain damage, but are still some type of how useful, use, usable, sorry. We had sports organizations use the Raul Lillard Sports Complex. The sports auditorium was used before it became a storehouse for our new materials, and it will be used again because activity is important. Schools have borrowed their gyms that were in good condition also, and the Melford Hazel with some small fixes will also be able to be used soon. Normalcy. Cultural facilities took a much bigger hit. And so in discussion with um, the Netherlands, we are getting some emergency assistance there, not only in fixing, but also funding for the fixing, but also um, technical advice especially where the archiving is concerned. Most of the archives that were at uh, being at Seamark in uh, Madame Estate and at the museum were wet, did get wet, and so paper and water, professionals need to deal with that to be able to attempt to restore it. We were busy with the digitalization process, so that will then go fast forward once we are in the recovery phase. So people of St. Martin, I am hopeful. I am hopeful that you will see the work of this government and not believe the hype. I am, as a matter of fact, taking this opportunity to say, if we really have the country of St. Martin at hand, at heart, that we should attempt not to force us into disunity and discord, but to think about coming together, all parties, and forming a national government. I will leave that there. Let me still make some responses as pertains to the notes within the ministry, because regardless to what happens at this level, the civil servants who are the executioners of our decisions will continue to work, and we will too, as long as we are able. The Student Support Services Division, which had headed all the care programs, before, during, and after Irma, will be having a free workshop applying to schools in the Netherlands. This is a reminder. This is on November 6 from 4 to 5 p.m. Please don't forget. The representation at the Latin American and Caribbean Memory of the World in Curacao. This ministry, ECYS, got word that the joint nomination submitted by Curacao, St. Martin, and Suriname was approved. This is all moving forward. The joint nomination was entitled The Documentary Heritage of the Enslaved People of the Dutch Caribbean. And it's the first of its kind. All of this information, quite pertinent, but we will send it in writing. I would also like to inform that I was invited to a conference to be held in France, the UNESCO General Conference, the 39th, and speak on behalf of St. Martin. But due to, I believe, the, the high cost involved, especially when we had no flights, 
And as the flights came online, the price went up too much for me to validate spending that money. So the SG of UNESCO will still be going, however, but the Minister Plenipotentiary, Henrietta Duran York, will be attending and addressing the conference on behalf of St. Martin. And I thank her for taking up that mantle. It will be broadcast live via website, which will be shared with the media on November 4th. This is in France. So St. Martin usually takes part in this every two years. And so it's a, 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 you know, we're happy that the Minister Plenipotentiary has a shorter travel and will be able to make that speech on my behalf. Where USM is concerned, I've had several questions concerning that. I must report that yesterday we sent them correspondence requesting further information to be able to assist. Um, fact of the matter is that um, USM did not start the new um, term for the fall, which would have ensured that several students could start school and government study financing would have also kicked in for those students in the amount of somewhere close to 200,000 guilders. Um, their, they received the 10% that they had submitted reports for. We are still awaiting audited reports and we are still continuing with discussions with interested parties in order to be able to save the university, not just to save this semester, but to save the university and create a sustainable and viable opportunity for St. Martin to be able to continue in tertiary education. St. Martin is around the corner, and that's the last I'm going to report on. There is a whole lot to celebrate in bouncing back and in collaborating with our partners in the North. The vision of this minister and the Vice President, Valerie Damaso, is to celebrate as one people, to move away from being French and being Dutch, but being Saint Martin, just Saint Martin. And many may have seen some of the ads already and wonder why we spelt it M-A-R-T-I-N, but that's the English spelling. And if you listen to our song, even though we are Dutch and French, we speak English much. That's our united language. And the English spelling of St. Martin is S-T-M-A-R-T-I-N. So that is why we are using that spelling. We want to highlight our oneness. We want to highlight our unity, not our separation. On March 23rd, is when we celebrate Con Treaty of Concordia Day, where the Dutch and the French sign an agreement to coexist on this 137 square mile island. And so that is where we will celebrate that on the 23rd of March. If you look at your uh, monument, you will see that date emblazoned on it, 1648, 1848. 1648 when the treaty was signed, 1848 when the monuments were built. So we will save the wreath laying for that date. On November 11th, we will be celebrating the people of St. Martin, the strength of the people of St. Martin, and the resilience of the people of St. Martin, that we are St. Martin strong. There is a full schedule will be available on St. Martin Emergency, the website of government, Facebook pages of government, including the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sport, but I look forward to seeing the community of St. Martin, French and Dutch, and all who have come here and made St. Martin home and love St. Martin and want to see St. Martin progress, that we come out, we celebrate with sports, with culture, with speeches, with debates, with activities that will promote economic development because the vendors will have an opportunity to sell St. Martin food and St. Martin drinks and St. Martin art, creative art, and singers and dancers and poets will get a chance to show who they are as St. Martin. So I implore you, follow our many activities every week from since mid-October, we have been busy. Last weekend was great. This weekend proves to be, will prove to be just as great. And um, what is exciting is the chance to highlight our hurricane heroes during this time. 
We thanked Laser 101 last Saturday and this week, Friday, and next week, Friday, God's Prayer Life, we'll be highlighting our other hurricane heroes, including GEBE, Telem, Vromi, for the cleanup, because that has been tremendous, tremendous. And I implore you, the people, to come out, celebrate as one St. Martin people. Wear your national colors or your floral cultural wear, but come out as one people and let us stand for St. Martin. And remember my call, united we stand. Prime Minister, the Honorable William Marlin. will the Council of Ministers do as, <clears throat> as a result of the formation of a new majority in Parliament and uh, the decision uh, they may take this afternoon or intend to take this afternoon in their meeting. The reason for aligning a new majority in Parliament uh, from a 10-seat majority to an 8-seat majority built and based on ship jumping once again is being attributed to the fact that government of St. Martin, the present government, is stagnating aid and uh, that the people of St. Martin can't wait any longer for aid. Like my colleague, the Minister of Education, has pointed out, and Minister Gibson as well, uh, and I think other ministers, uh, the people have been receiving aid all along. People have been receiving aid all along. We are now entering the, state, the stage of recovery. Actually, I, in a press briefing uh, the, last week, I said that um, the Karel Dorman had arrived for the last time, and the Karel Dorm, but that does not mean it's the end of the emergency aid. Uh, there, there will be other shipments, not on the Karel Dorman, but other stuff will continue to come, and the preparations are being made for the recovery phase to begin. But for the recovery, we have the ongoing issue of the conditions, and that is what the issue was about. Now, the new majority of eight has cooked up the story that it's because of the uh, situation following the hurricane is why they have taken this decision. But records would show that for months before the hurricane, um, secret attempts and discussions, invitations to meetings had already been taking place and had already been made to at least two members of the coalition because the Democratic Party was hell-bent on leaving and therefore needed one more to go with them. The same Democratic Party that said uh, they uh, are against ship jumping, ship jumpers should be punished. And you can recall um, when uh, the government fell in 2015, I think it was, that uh, the then Prime Minister Marcel Gums said we need to put an end to ship jumping and punish the ship jumpers which resulted in all the elections. Um, the legislation that had to be put in place to curb the ship jumping was prepared by me. And the proposal basically was that you cannot uh, take somebody's seat from them if they jump, 
but you can uh, put a stop by it because they are not jumping ship based on a disagreement. They are jumping ship for personal political gain. Um, and therefore, the proposal that was drafted was if someone jumps ship, that individual MP retains all his rights in terms of uh, the, the, the right to vote his conscience, uh, the right to question ministers, the right to submit uh, questions, the right to vote in meetings, but in the formation of any government, uh, that member would not be able to take part. That is what the proposal was. Um, met with resistance uh, from The Hague because it was against the free mandate. Um, I've always said we got to make legislation based on our reality. We cannot make legislation based on realities somewhere else. And today we see the same thing is happening. Uh, so you use the hurricane, um, you create fake news. Um, the prime minister is who put containers at the border. The prime minister criticized the military. The prime minister is who caused uh, the looting. The prime minister is who caused the hurricane. The prime minister is who caused Maho to be blown away and people are out of jobs. The prime minister who caused everything under the sun. Um, and I think by now people of St. Martin would know that is not true. That is not true. And today we realize why all of this uh, attack on the prime minister was being built so that when the time comes for them to make their move, the minds of the people of St. Martin and by extension the kingdom and with support of media from the Netherlands, uh, we need the integrity chamber. And, and what's interesting in this whole integrity chamber discussion, um, it is the parliament of St. Martin in a unanimous vote in January, I think it was, after my meeting with Minister Plasteric, um, 14 members were present and all 14 members voted against the establishing of, a, of the integrity chamber the way the Dutch wanted it. Today, the prime minister is being accused of uh, obstructing aid to the people of St. Martin because, not because he is against St. Martin establishing an integrity chamber because he is telling the Dutch, using the integrity chamber as a threat if you don't accept it the way we want, and including like the, the Minister of Justice said a while ago, um, <clears throat> taking an existing and functioning agreement that you have, want to amend it again uh, unilaterally, uh, without any discussion actually, take it or leave it. If you don't take it this way, there will be no aid. The Minister of Finance pointed out and the records would show that the government of St. Martin had already, and I've said this as well in a previous press briefing, the government has already taken a decision weeks ago to provide assistance to people who needed assistance. To, um, we created a budget to put roofs and repair homes, repair roofs, to persons who would qualify. Um, just last week, I told the Minister of Public, of Public Health and Social Affairs, I said I flinched when in the press briefing, and you can recall that, in the press briefing the Minister said uh, his management style is um, not to interfere with the organization. Um, because the Minister knew that he could take the heat for not taking his responsibility. It's the Minister of Social Affairs that has to come with the proposals. It's the Minister of Social Affairs that need to organize um, people coming to the government building, those who need assistance. Um, I told him he has to make an announcement 
he has to ensure that an announcement is made for people. He said, um, there were enough people coming on their own. I said, no, that cannot be. People need to know that government is ready to help them and that they should come. It doesn't mean that if whoever comes will get, um, you need to qualify. But in order to qualify, you need to have the criteria. Um, so there was a clear obstruction on the part of the minister to delay, to delay and postpone. And meanwhile, let the prime minister take the heat for the fact that the people aren't getting aid. As I speak right now, there are supposed to be containers that has food in it. As I speak right now, I can show you the evidence. They are tarpaulins locked in, in the building. And the question is then, why aren't they not being distributed? Because you need to use them and the leverage to justify to the people. And then I guess the plan is, as soon as we bring in our government, we will show the people that aid is coming. Um, aid has been coming, but the recovery, the recovery, that is where the discussion is. This morning, I've also taken what you can call a, a last approach, a last attempt, um, because it's all in the interest of the people of St. Martin. When I have stood up to the demands of the Dutch, it wasn't in William Marlin's personal interest. It was in the interest of St. Martin. And as I said in Parliament, all of us who are ministers, all of us who are members of Parliament, have taken an oath to uphold and defend our Constitution. And blinded, blinded by the need to criticize whatever the Prime Minister says, at all accounts, one member of Parliament said, St. Martin doesn't have a constitution. St. Martin doesn't have a constitution. Um, so what I have done this morning was I sent a message to leader of the UP party, Theo Heilago, leader of the USP party, Franz Richardson, leader of the Democratic Party, Sarah Westcott Williams. And I said, in the interest of St. Martin, let us hold talks to arrive at a national government. Because if everybody is on board with the interest of St. Martin and the interest of the people of St. Martin, then we will put party politics and politics in general above the interest, uh, we will put the interest of St. Martin above party politics. Then we are talking about our people first, the interest of St. Martin first. In the Netherlands, they have their agenda and they have closed ranks politically. They have gotten everybody on board. They have even gotten the media on their side to promote their agenda. On St. Martin, we are divided, and the people, the same people we say are suffering, rather than working in the interest of those people, we are working in our own political interest. As I said, the attempt to break government has nothing to do with a hurricane because members would tell you um, that there were discussions before, before, the election uh, before the hurricane. So I've invited them. I haven't received any reaction from the leader of the Democratic Party, nor from the leader of the USP party. Tends to meet uh, with the intention of um, passing a motion of no confidence in the present government. They have submitted a letter um, stating that there is a new majority and a new majority ready to form a government. 
as long as the ministers don't resign, you can't form a new government. Um, so I do not know the intentions of their meeting because they said uh, in one letter, in one correspondence, that there's a new majority and they want to make sure that the people of St. Martin get uh, the relief, the aid they need by agreeing with the conditions as put forward by the Dutch. Um, the Council of Ministers uh, will meet, uh, or the intention is for the Council of Ministers to meet um, this afternoon as well. And as would be expected, the, <clears throat> the Council of Ministers um, would continue on the philosophy that Shib jumpers should be punished. And when we say Shib jumpers should be punished, the public should not be subjected to uh, these constant changes in government, not based on a political fallout or a disagreement, but based on political parties wanting control of government for other agendas. Um, if prior to the hurricane there were no discussions, then one can say there is a fallout. Um, there is no difference in what I want and what the leader of the Democratic Party wants. And, and there should be no difference than what the leader of the US, US uh, the UP party wants. Because in the first meeting that I was there, he said it is not time to play politics, that he wanted to extend a hand to the government to help rebuild our country. Um, shortly thereafter, there were accusations levied at the prime minister that he was the cause of the looting. And from there, everything accelerated. So when the Council of Ministers meet this afternoon, if Parliament continues with their meeting to uh, pass a motion of no confidence in the Council of Ministers, the Council of Ministers will dissolve Parliament and in so doing, give the mandate back to the people to be the judge and jury um, as to how we will move forward. Now one can say, um, we are creating more hardship for the people of St. Martin. No, we are not. These are provisions uh, that our system allows for. And if we are going to continue, um, we should then place the blame on those who have disrupted governance. Because we never said we do not want aid. We never said that we will refuse aid. We've been accepting it. We will continue to accept more. The only thing we were having was a discussion, and that is our good right to represent the people of St. Martin. If we would look at um, more and more legal people are coming forward um, in the Netherlands to say the approach of the Netherlands is not a justifiable one. But we have a meeting to attend to, and I want to Thank you for your presence.